Hello everyone, um, my name is Sean Fury and I'm the director of the RWSN Secretariat at Scout Foundation. And the purpose of this video is to walk you through the draft strategy for the Rural Water Supply Network for 2024 to 2030. Um, it's a very different strategy to what we've had before. And so we really welcome ideas and feedback from everyone on um, what's good about it, what's not good about it, what's clear, what's unclear, uh, what's missing, uh, maybe uh, what's, uh, what could be sharpened, all those kind of things. So really welcome your feedback. Okay, so we start off with the executive summary, which just sets out uh, really what this document is about and uh, why, it's, why it exists. And it really emphasizing that this is an invitation um, to you and to everyone to be part of this global movement to achieve sustainable um, universal access to safe drinking water and how uh, as the network we can help you achieve your goals. So in our new strategy our vision is altered slightly but generally uh, very similar to before. So our vision is of a world in which all people enjoy safely managed water services that are resilient and sustainable. You'll notice here that it doesn't explicitly mention rural. Um, partly, uh, we ha had a lot of back and forth about this. Um, although rural is important and we won't be getting into urban, there are some things that we cover, particularly in terms of point sources, uh, sort of the hand pump technologies, rainwater harvesting, um, hand dug wells, things like that do, uh, do actually uh, occur in urban areas as well. And there's a bit of a transition between urban and, and rural. So uh, we thought uh, really, uh, we're not just saying, ah, oh, wouldn't it be great just to have universal access just for rural people and urban people can, you can sort themselves out. So it's a bit more inclusive. Um, our mission is to be a convening space for individual professionals and organizations to collaborate, develop guidelines, standards, curate knowledge, promote lifelong learning in the rural water sector. So this is mission statement is taking quite a broad uh, vision and really trying to define uh, what is the network's role in this big, big, big challenge. Um, and emphasizing that uh, RWSN is a network of individuals and organizations because some networks and associations are just for individuals and some are just for organizations, but we kind of mix of both. Uh, the aim of the network is to improve the quality of rural management and services. So um, this is really about, okay, so, um, what is it that we as a network are trying to achieve to contribute to, to the vision? Um, and a lot of it comes around to the quality of implementation um, of both the, you know, building out and extending rural water services, um, but also maintaining them. And also around the, the broader management of, of, of water uh, around, um, uh, uh, there is around the water supply. So it's that connection between water supply and water resources sort of uh, baked into this statement. Then our values, this is really stating, you know, how we as a network want to approach this challenge um, and what values we expect all our partners, our members, ourselves really to follow. So really um, showing that people are at the heart of uh, solving the rural water supply challenges. And to do that, we need openness and respect uh, that we think uh, improve collaboration and learning are core to eliminating poverty and achieving the vision. Um, and that we should always lead by example with professionalism and a commitment to high quality work and integrity and a focus on water user needs. And then finally, diversity that's essential in our activities should always have a vibrant mix of voices from different nationalities, backgrounds, professions, genders and ages. 
and so forth. So this is this one slide is really our elevator pitch. This is what Ardham is in is. This is what we do. This is why we do it. This is how we do it. And this is our kind of mindset in approaching this this formidable challenge. Uh, the next following slides, I'm not going to read out, but uh, you can read for yourselves. But what they try to do is to to capture uh, a bit about you know what it is we're trying to do and why you know why the focus on rural water why we see it is is so Im important um and to build up that picture we've gone through uh the, some of the latest uh thinking on trends and on the state of drinking water services um generally not just rural but uh, but, but but more generally as well so I think uh, just to highlight on this slide, we did listen to our members through uh, member survey earlier this year and through other means. And what's come really strongly is the impact of climate change, droughts and water scarcity. This came out in the member survey as the number one problem by quite a substantial margin, um, which compares to previous surveys where it's been about um, fourth or fifth priority. So we've really taken note of that. Uh, the barriers um, around policy and legislation, kind of the enabling environment for rural water supply, um, that's important to note, but it's quite tricky for us as our Centre to focus on because we're a bit more of a practical focused network. Um, so we can't meet all our members' interests, but we're certainly mindful of this being a, being a, a, a barrier. Here are some of the documents that we refer to in compiling this introduction. If there are uh, others that you think that we should uh, bring in uh, points in this introduction we think that need to be improved, then please do let us know. Rural water supply faces a number of complex challenges. Uh, as a network, we can't hope to address all of them, but we should be mindful of them to really prioritise our efforts on focusing on you know, what can be done and where can we really try and make a difference. So getting on to the strategy itself, we split it into two parts. The first part is how the uh, network um, really functions. And we put a lot more effort into this bit. And then part two, which is on the thematic focus, is actually a lot looser than previous strategies. And I'll explain why when we get to uh, the, the, the part two. But let's have a look at the operating strategy. So first of all, we've got our three pillars. So this is based on the 30 years of experience that RWSN um, has built up. And really these three pillars of what, what do we do and uh, what do people value? So it's around networking, connecting and convening. It's about knowledge brokering and being an information hub. And it's around uh, developing and testing, uh, training guidelines and, and standards. So those are, those are our three kind of main pillars. Our theory of change as to how these three pillars can uh, contribute to the vision are really based around the the, um, the experience and and desire that these three uh, pillars contribute to uh, the outcome level. Highly motivated, skilled, well informed individuals. Uh, that in turn uh, form competent and professional teams and organizations, and that in turn uh, build high trust collaborations between organizations and individuals. And that's really what we want to foster. And that uh, what we feel is that when you have these in place, that this will really uh, have a major influence on improving the implementation quality of rural water management uh, and services, but this isn't a this isn't a mechanistic kind of logical framework process of of uh, of cause and effect. There are complex uh, feedback loops throughout throughout of this, and but part of the challenge of of uh, the network is that it's somewhat 
uh, challenging to really measure and show and demonstrate how uh, activities um, lead to outcomes, lead to impacts and uh, contribute to the vision. But that doesn't, shouldn't stop us from trying. OK, so on this page really sets out where we see RWSN fitting within the global architecture of water and international development and where we see ourselves making a strategically significant contribution in specifically to sustainable development goal six uh, and really highlighting where this blueprint for acceleration that was published earlier this year where we feel the network um, can can make a um, make a difference but we welcome your your views on this and also uh, just highlight some of the alliances and partnerships we have with other networks other associations which uh, are ongoing and are very very fruitful and and valuable okay so we've got our theory of change uh, we've got our positioning globally now we're getting a bit more into the detail of how RWSN works. So we want to do it on a mix of bottom up, uh, top down and middle out. And this slide uh, explains a little bit about uh, that and what we mean by that. And really, this is about connecting people in different ways at uh, different levels. Dealing with scale is a really tricky area for us as a global network with a small secretariat and very limited resources. There are hundreds of thousands, if not maybe a couple of million people working in rural water supply indirectly, uh, directly, many of them voluntary if because of the prevalence of community management. There are many contextual factors that uh, affect how well or not a rural water service can work because we're dealing with half the world's population and we're dealing with every environment that this planet has to offer. But that said, there are elements uh, that do lend themselves to quite prescriptive standards, uh, hand pump standards being one example, but there are probably many others all areas that lend themselves to, to modular solutions so that they are uh, can be tailored to a specific context as long as we have a reasonable idea of which context they they have a good chance of working in and, and so we want to kind of foster this uh, this tiered approach so that those who are really working on the ground don't have to reinvent uh, everything from first principles for every new scheme or every existing scheme that there are some industry standards uh, uh, standards and guidelines that they can follow and experiences they can learn from from, from elsewhere but at the same time they still have the, uh, the the skills and problem solving abilities to be able to tackle the uh, contextual challenges that they ha have in front of them so one of the ways that we will be doing this as a network is to strengthen our regional hubs and our networking at a national level and working as much as possible with, with national wash and water networks. Now we get to the heart of the strategy. This is where we're really trying to take what we're good at, the three pillars that we have, and to give more structure for theme leaders and members and regional coordinators to choose what level of intensity uh, do they want to work at with different topics and different issues uh, and how much resources uh, are needed and, and can be mobilized and so we have five tiers here from activities that are uh, generally easy to do don't take much time don't take a huge amount of effort to very intensive lifelong learning of convening committees convening action groups uh, to produce specific out outputs so uh, it's being mindful of the fact that um, the some of these networking activities that we do require more uh, resources and may take longer and needs a bit more patience but 
that they will probably deliver much more measurable outcomes and impacts, whether it's not just the developing of new guidelines and standards, but also evidence of those guidelines and standards being applied and used and delivering uh, benefits. Um, this uh, next page then takes that to the next level of, of detail, so I won't go into this. I'll let you read this and, and, and comment but really just to say that of the activity categories that sort of drop out of this, it's around uh, activities around being a knowledge hub, around um, member exchange, around convening action groups, uh, uh, convening specialist guidelines and standards committees, and uh, around lifelong learning. So uh, welcome your feedback on this. Now we get into the, the three pillars themselves and uh, a bit more detail on uh, our strategy for developing these. Now the core of what we do is that these backbone networking services, this is the most difficult uh, part of the network to fund. Um, so uh, the, all the boring stuff that nobody's interested in, in uh, funding. So things like planning and reporting and management and all the coordination and the governance and fundraising and the sector coordination and uh, de dealing with members and member organizations, um, that side of it. And also the core networking activities. So the, some of these are, you know, that can expand and contract depending on how much uh, resources uh, we have. But uh, on the very fundamental level, we need to have a website. We need to have our online uh, discussion communities. Uh, we need to be uh, providing news updates through blogs and social media and, uh, and through, through email. Um, and then it, the more uh, sort of resources we have, the more different types of activities we can do um, throughout, the, throughout the year. The uh, next part of, of networking, connecting, convening is really about supporting uh, scaling up. So this is about helping to convene and connect people at a, a level that's appropriate to them. So we've identified these kind of four common levels that uh, that our members find themselves at from kind of early stage, young entrepreneurs, uh, inventors, to startup organizations, to quite established SMEs or NGOs, um, and, and then find out to sort of large scale providers uh, and implementers. And quite often um, our, our members are looking for how to move up to the, to the next level and who can provide them the support, not just into funding, I mean, this slide kind of highlights the funding side of it, but it's not just about funding. It all, can also be about mentoring, support, connections, uh, a whole whole range of things. But I think this slide is, is kind of helpful on illustrating that uh, as we desire to uh, increase the, the level of impact, uh, who are the best uh, people to connect with um, on the, uh, the, the scale that they're, they're comfortable with uh, funding and supporting. On, our, on to our next pillar, so on, uh, around knowledge brokering. So this is really about building a bridge between research and practice and policy, which we've been doing a lot uh, over the last 10 years with the Upgrow program, the REACH program, and more recently with Real Water. Um, and uh, so a lot of this is around using the network to help uh, researchers and potential research users um, develop relevant effective research outputs and that those outputs are then translated into uh, into practice and it's a very it's a very interesting space that we've been working in over the last few years and we want to continue to do th that um, and then the next pillar is around training guidelines and standards, which is something that, that has been called to the network uh, since the beginning. Um, originally very, very, very focused on, on hand pump technology, but these days we're much broader. Uh, we've done 
uh, develop guidelines as a network, not just under our own branding, but for uh, other organisations as well, notably UNICEF with their um, professional water well drilling guidelines and their uh, uh, guidance for uh, leaving no one behind. Um, so that, uh, this is an important way of translating evidence, research, uh, experience of, ne of network members, codifying those into <clears throat> standards and guidelines that can help others improve the quality of their work. And then finally, the lifelong learning, we developed a, a draft strategy a while ago, uh, and this really breaks it down into uh, looking at rural water supply from the perspective of, uh, of, of people and their careers and their needs of, from a network like ours at different stages of their career to really attract talent into uh, rural water supply and to as much as possible retain that talent, which is for various reasons um, quite, uh, quite challenging. So our mentoring scheme remains the um, linchpin of, 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 our, of, our, of our work. It's proved very successful and we want to continue to grow and develop that mentoring scheme. But there are another, a number of other activities in our lifelong learning approach that we want to strengthen and, and develop. Turning now to the governance and membership. Um, so the strategy doesn't go into much detail on uh, the structure of the network because this is set out in a separate document called the Governance Protocol, which was uh, finalised at the beginning of uh, this year and really sets out the roles, responsibilities and rules for the, uh, the different parts of uh, the, the network because LWSN is not a legal entity, it is a partnership, uh, so uh, it's, there's a lot of, we need a lot of, a lot of trust, a lot of common understanding about who does what and why and, and all the rest of it. So this, this just explains a little bit about the structure of, of who, um, who is what in management, but also the, the membership. And then we're continuing to evolve the membership um, as, uh, as we look to diversify <clears throat> our income and and also offer uh, stronger services to um, to more and more people um, around the world most of our members are either in or or uh, working in uh, sub-saharan Africa and we're looking to expand our membership in other other regions as well this slide just gives a quick overview of the main responsibilities amongst the RWSN team and partners. Next couple of slides really are our strategy in terms of what we want to do in terms of supporting diversity um, w uh, within the network um, and particularly because we are a network that is focused on um, low and middle income countries that it's important that it is uh, as much as possible voices from the from those countries that are uh, are very visible very present um, part of it is following what is the the rea current realities of uh, of what's happening in these countries part of it is more taking a leadership position in terms of where we would like the sector to go and I would say in this particularly in relation to to women because in a, uh, a sector where which is really quite male dominated we want to see more um, uh, women as leaders as decision makers um, and we will do everything we can to facilitate that okay and here we just emphasize that we want to focus on supporting young professionals and the outline of how we want to do that i think this will continue to evolve over time and welcome ideas and thoughts on how we do this our business model finally is uh, an outline of how we approach to finding the resources to deliver all of this this is the most difficult part of um, the whole strategy because we can set some 
uh, ambitious goals and targets, but without the resources and partnerships to deliver it, um, we, we won't be able to do that. Um, so this just outlines our current approach, but this is something that will continue to evolve and change both as we take an entrepreneurial approach to developing a uh, a new and better business model that enables our WSN to grow and to flourish, but also responding to what's happening um, uh, in the world and the, uh, what opportunities and threats there are. Okay, so part two. Um, which is the thematic focus of the strategy. So we've, we've spent a lot of time looking on how the network works. Now it's like, where do we focus our, our efforts? Now to do that, we've introduced uh, a new concept in the strategy around uh, framing. So this is because there is various different ways that we can look at rural water supply and um, our themes that we've had uh, up until now are great and really good because they're, they're generally pretty specific and targeted, but there's more than one way to look at, at, at this. So um, we'll just explore those in a little bit more detail. The themes are largely unchanged from what uh, they were before and how they're set out in the um, the, the governance protocol, so it's about having a clear outcome, wide applicability, having theme leaders, having a, a, an online d-group community, and a, a wider sphere of, of partners and organisations. Um, we've got uh, six themes uh, at the moment in our current strategy. We will look very seriously at uh, water quality and safety as becoming a, a seventh theme and whether that becomes a theme or just an, an action group that's uh, much more targeted and focused, uh, we'll have to have to wait and see. So framing number one um, is seeing uh, rural water supply as very focused on household drinking water services and as a public service and that it is part of the water and sanitation and hygiene system the wash system and this is where we sort of look at uh, uh, rural water supply within the framing of system strengthening the bigger discussion that's going on led by groups like agenda for change and you can see their their eight building blocks here um, and that's quite a useful framework for, for looking at, um, at rural water services. It comes with a, a certain urban mindset, I'm going to call it, where uh, it's quite a linear uh, process of you take water from a water source, from the natural world. It goes through water supply infrastructure that's being run by an operator or a community group or whatever. Uh, it goes to the household and then they use that uh, that that water for um, drinking, cooking, cleaning, sanitation and, and, and hygiene. Um, generally, um, in rural, particularly dispersed settlements, the issue of wastewater is beyond like a, a, a soak away is, is generally not addressed. And there's there's an open question there about when you're getting into small towns and peri-urban areas. But really the goal of this framing is around public health and around um, relieving the burden, particularly on, on uh, girls and, and women. Uh, this is the goal of, of, of this framing. The second framing is uh, really looking at rural water supply from the perspective of the water user as uh, rural people who are generally um, around the world farmers um, or foresters or, or fishing or they're in the primary industries um, and so they often use multiple water sources at different times of the year for different purposes and they have uh, use water for many different purposes some of which are for income generation so whereas under the wash system um, the uh, water supply is seen as a cost that needs to be paid for in, in order to, to achieve a public good. Under this framing, water is seen as an asset that is used to 
drive and unlock potential of household income. Um, not just cash income, but also in terms of food and nutrition and, and many other benefits. And so this really places uh, um, rural water supply within the broader um, field of rural development and links, and there are complex interlinkages with other sectors, particularly with um, uh, with the with the natural world, with ecosystem services, with biodiversity, with other potential uh, potential other links with other sectors such as uh, electrification and energy. There are dependencies um, such as particularly around transport infrastructure um, and uh, opportunities um, and constraints from other economic activities in rural areas, not just the primary industries, um, obviously, you know, the, the competition and synergy with agriculture, but also things like tourism, which is important in, in many, many parts of the world as, as well. So this is quite a complex framing, uh, but one that we don't uh, generally look at um, that often because the the wash framing is, is more common. And then finally, the other main, third main framing is around uh, climate change and resilience and water security. And this is links to a whole complex set of, of, of challenges that uh, are seemingly getting more and more extreme. So the first two framings are, can be seen within a fairly steady state uh, situation of development. Um, and development cooperation. This is getting much more into the links with shocks, uh, both you know short shocks from um, natural disasters, not so natural disasters, um, but also the links with fragility, with humanitarian interventions, a whole complex set of, uh, of issues that, uh, that affect uh, the fact rural water supply. So within those three framings, we have are six six themes and um, I'm not going to go through uh, each of these in, in detail please uh, the uh, have a look through give your feedback I would just say that the big shift compared to previous strategies is that um, the previous strategies were much more prescriptive in terms of activities uh, outcomes um, outputs and so forth that was largely driven by a, uh, a particular um, donor and their need for a logical framework approach um, which doesn't really fit how a network works um, because there are no guarantees in terms of the resources in terms of the partnerships it's it's very very dynamic in terms of um, what uh, what and where um, a network like RWSN can focus its efforts so really the the, the purpose of this uh, remaining part of the strategy is to kind of give the direction of travel of where we think the high priority areas are, both in terms of where our members uh, are, are interested and want support, but also where we as a uh, network, we feel that we should uh, take a leadership position um, to um, kind of go at maybe slightly ahead of our members to encourage them to think in a, uh, about a particular topic or to take up a particular approach or, or whatever. So that's that's the thinking around this. So th this this in this area is much more um, uh, it's much more flexible. And again, thinking about the the three previous fr framings. So uh, for each of these um, themes, thinking about okay, so how does uh, how does something like th this theme data for action. Uh, how does that change if you're thinking in terms of wash system strengthening or in terms of rural development or in terms of climate change and, uh, and, and water security? Leave No One Behind is looking at all the different aspects of uh, barriers to achieving universal access. Multiple use water services provides that link between rural uh, water supply and agriculture between particularly farmer led irrigation and the importance of looking at that uh, livelihoods framing of, of water supply. 
self supplies around uh, household investment in their own water supplies um, and the services the, the small to medium sized enterprises that support that demand sustainable groundwater development uh, retains its focus on pumping technologies on professionalizing water well drilling and on the broader piece on groundwater resources management to ensure safe and secure rural water supplies sustainable services is the uh, all all the different components of how to run a rural water uh, service operation and uh, what's what can be learned and in particular what is is promising and leading the way like uh, results-based contracting which is proving to be particularly promising and then finally water quality and water safety which is something that is there's there's a lot of member interest um, to uh, convene um, those on who are facing these issues on a day-to-day -day basis there's also a lot of ongoing research um, and researchers that would like their research to be translated into use and then finally the uh, WHO guidelines on uh, small water systems that will be published this is a, a really critical document for um, for rural water supply we want to support the uptake and evolution of, of that of those guidelines going forward so here are some of the documents on which this strategy is based. I want to emphasize that uh, RWSN is very much a team effort and a really great team effort from people from loads of different organizations and parts of the world. And we really, um, yeah, I'm really grateful for everything that everyone does to make RWSN work. Um, these are just some of the people. Uh, there are many, many more, but uh, thank you very much. So finally, just to reiterate that we really want to hear from you. What do you think about the strategy? What's good? What's bad? What could be better? Uh, what do you like? Um, and if you can let us know by the 30th of November, there's a Google form here with this complicated link that you can click on and follow. Or if you have any questions or comments, you can contact me directly by email or through social media or whatever. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to hearing from you.